Thank you for that song. That's one of my favorites. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Good morning. The Lord is good. All the time. And great. And what? Great. Yes, he is. And he's greatly to be praised. Amen. So we will get started. Uh, I need you to pray for me. Father, we thank you for all that you do. Be with us now and be with me. That we will receive this food from on high. Take it in. Digest it. And let it grow in us. That our lives may be acceptable to you. All these best we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What we're going to talk about this morning is love and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Love and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The connection. What is the connection? You hear the word love tossed around these days like it was... I mean, it's, people just say, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. 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 Okay. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> well, if we go look at something this morning, we, we want to find out about that love and where it's pointed. Um... We read the scripture, 145, Psalms 145, 3 and 4. It says, God is so great that it's, it's unsearchable. Imagine serving a God like that where his grace, his power cannot be measured. It should bring about humility to us. It should... Lead us to focus our love and our affections in a certain direction, his direction. We're going to look, look at our sermon text this morning is John 13, John 14, 15. Our sermon text is John 14, 15. John 14, 15. And this is, this is the acid test. This is the acid test for those who want to follow Jesus, be like Jesus, or those who are really preparing to meet him. This is the acid test. Whether you're a Christian, whether you're a true follower, or what, is your love genuine? Or are you just saying it? It's something they say, well, I ought to say that about Jesus. I ought to say, if I'm a Christian, I ought to say that I love him. Jesus says, I can't take your word for it. See, love is an action thing. Listen to this. You say, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That is the acid test. It's a doing thing. Love is an action word. Uh, the title of the sermon is The Things We Make. You can just about know where we're headed with this, right? The Things We Make. And... The thought I want you to keep in mind is, is keep life real. Keep life real. With all God's powers, his unmeasurableness, his, his greatness, he is willing to use it all that we might have life in all abundance. All abundance. He gives us freedom of mind for, to use for a life of discovery, to discover that greatness. Then he gives us imagination which gives us the ability to fill our lives with meaning as we relate to the things that has been created and to one who created them. God gave us imagination for that. God is so great, he's so great, that each person is held responsible for understanding this. We are held guilty if we neglect it or forget it. Now, this question arises. Why are things the way they are in spite of who God is? Who can, who can explain it? Why are things, the way, if God is so great, his greatness is unsearchable, he's so powerful, all grace and power and all this, why are things the way they are in spite of who he is? Turn to Genesis 6, 5 with me. Genesis 6, 5. Why are things the way they are? 
the things we make. Genesis 6, 5. It says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great. There's that word again. He saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Talking about the things we make. Why are things the way they are in spite of who God really is? It says, man, now he has turned from God and deadly consequences follow. The gift of imagination has now become crooked. A crooked imagination. The mind, now listen, listen to this carefully now. A crooked imagination, the mind of men has become a literal idol factory. That means man can make anything or anybody into an idol. Kind of quiet right now. Man, because of his crooked imagination, can make anything or anybody into an idol. Because of this, because of this, the earth is filled with violence. We now have a human system opposed to God. We are now imagining things in our minds that we bow down and worship to. We have a tendency to be blinded to the potential for other gods to displace the great God in our mind. That's why I talked about love. Oh, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. But we are, have a tendency to be blind to the fact, to the potential of other gods to come in and displace God in our minds. And it's because we have made them. This is, this is a witty social post. This, this came in on a social post. It says, God is retiring. Who do we get to permanently take his place? You see, you see, you see what I'm talking about here. You know, imagination. This, this was the answer that was suggested to the one who questioned. It says, "You." And it says, "What will be the first thing you would do as the new God?" He says, "I'm gonna add a new commandment. What would it be? Thou shalt not be so easily influenced by social media." <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. Social media is not a joke. There are, some, there are some good things you can find on social media. But social media is a force. It is a power. It has authority. And who gave it authority? We did. Now that's crazy. We gave it authority. Listen to this. No one could have foreseen a few decades ago just how quickly social media would become a power that people would have so deep affections for it. Some people spend their whole day on social media. That's where they meet friends. That's where they do what they do. They even fight on social media. It has become very important to people. One, many have become more confident through this channel of common communication rather than face to face. What, what, what has happened is we have come a bunch of cowards. Oh, did I go too far with that? <laughs> did I go? Did I go too far? Preach. <laughs> we have literally came, become a bunch of cowards because we would rather 
go through the virtual, whatever that is, then come face to face with people and talk with them. We claim to have, we claim to love people over social media. Oh, I love you. Listen to this. It is used to create an identity. A place where people establish social status. A place to experience a sense of belonging. Who made it? Who made this? Who made this God? The God of social media. Now, 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 now don't, don't go home and throw your, your device in the toilet. <laughs> but just understand love and the things we make. Understand it. Just understand it, that there's a proper perspective we ought to keep things in. Listen to this. When Jesus came, he said many things people who well, people were unprepared to accept or to understand. He said things, man, Jesus said some things. He said things, man, they would have grabbed Jesus and throw him off a cliff. He was saying things, he said, well, who is this guy? He touched on things people loved and cherished. Exposing them not to be worthy of the affection they placed on them. All right. I'm, uh, I'm going a little further. Is all right? All right. Matthew 10, 37. Remember Jesus said some things that, that people didn't, didn't quite get. So I don't, I don't, I don't get this. This to this. 10 verse 30, Matthew 10 verse 37. This is this carefully now. The things we make. He says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Back in that time, during that time, family was the thing. And still, and, and uh, people were so clannish, and it's all the things centered around the patriarch of the father, the male in the family. Whatever he said would go. He determined who accepted what, who rejected what, what was good and what was bad. In other words, there were times where people didn't even have a brain. He made all the decisions. And when Jesus comes, I mean, people will go along with that. So that's fine, you know, I'm, I'm going on that because that's, that's my father. And I love and I love him. That's my mother, and I love him. That's my children, and I love them. But Jesus came by and said, look, who does Jesus think he is? Is Jesus, Jesus ego tripping? <laughs> is he ego tripping? He that loveth father or mother, and the key word is more. If you love them more than me, if you love son and daughter more than me, then you ain't worthy of me. The question is, who does Jesus think he is? Who does Jesus think he is by saying such a thing? <laughs> Who does Jesus think he is? Imagine yourself being there. Listen to that. <laughs> Listen to that. Imagine yourself being there. Say, well, I got my, oh man, I just love my wife. I just love my children. And that's what people live for. Say, well, that's, that's what we ought to do. He said, but if you love them more than me, you have made them what? A God. First of all, here's what, here's what happened. You overrate them. You overvalue them. And you overpromote them. God's greatness is unsearchable. It cannot be measured. You can't love 
people more than you could love the God, the Creator. Amen. You don't do that. Amen. Family and children, the husband and the wife's family is a gift from God. You don't love you don't love the gift more than you love the gift Amen. giver. So we make these things in our imagination. While love for things of this world tends to lead us away from the truth, Jesus is the central figure that leads us toward God and away from the com compromising culture of our day. Boy, we, 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 we can make things. Man, we can make some things. What other thing, place, or person could love, we could love more than the living God? What? And then, what would you call it? What would you call something or somebody that you love more than God? What would you call it? How would you feel about it? How would you relate to it? So what is an idol? What is an idol? Why is it even mentioned in the Bible, especially among God's people? Idol is an image worshipped as God, an idea, a much loved or admired person or thing. I saw a guy the other day talking about much loved and cherished thing. He was riding on his boat, on his lawnmower. He had, man, he had that lawnmower dressed up like a cop. <laughs> and he had his American flag stuck out the back. And he was moving down the highway, on the highway where cars go. <laughs> he loved that, he loved that lawnmower. <laughs> Where's Eric at? <laughs> Eric, we were in Sabbath school class one day. What, what was that? But boy, we messed up, ain't we? <laughs> boy, we messed up. It's because of those crooked imaginations. God gave us the imagination as a gift to fill our lives with meaning as we relate to the things that He has created. And, and I think it was last Sabbath, the one Sabbath, we had some. Some kind of flowers up here. What were those little purple flowers? Orchid. I started to come up on the drop them and look at them and smell them. In imagination, God, that's God. Those orchids. That imagination. And in my imagination, I said, but God is a lover of beauty. Amen. We're going to look at something here in a minute. If you want to insult God, if, here's where you can really insult God. Claim to love him and then bring other lovers before him. A man and a woman, a uh, man and a woman, wife and husband, the husband cheats on, on the wife. He waits till the wife leaves and goes wherever she's going to work. Then he brings his lover into the house in their bed. Have mercy. That's right. That's, that, that's low. But listen to this. Claim the love of God and then bring other lovers before him. What happens when a person, when people cannot tell what is real from what is imagined? What happens? First of all, they lose touch with reality. Behavior may be very strange and sometimes very shocking. Isaiah. Isaiah. 44. Isaiah 44. Why is the word idol even in the Bible and especially it is mentioned among God's people? Now that's crazy. Isaiah 44, 
Verse 9 and verse 10 start with. Are we there? Amen. Here's what it says. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Useless. And their delectable things or their precious things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor, understand, nor know that they may be ashamed. In other words, they're saying something about you. He said, well, would you, if, you, if, you turn around, if you make an idol, then you are a very ignorant person. You are a very foolish person. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. It says, who hath formed a God or a molten graven image that is profitable for anything or nothing? Some translations, here's what some translations say about that verse. It says, who but a fool would try to make his own God? All right? Here's what's happening in here. This man, there's a tree. He raises a tree and it grows up. The tree grows up. He cuts the tree down and he takes part of the tree and he warms himself with it. Then he takes part of the tree and he cooks his food with it. What's left, he takes and carves it into an image. And then he takes the image and bows down to it and prays to it. Please, you are my God. Please deliver me. Do you think that's losing touch with reality? Do you think that's shocking behavior? Great day in the morning. You can read about it in verse 17. It says, And the residue thereof he maketh a God, even his, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my what? Now, verse 18 exposes this man to be a very foolish Ignorant person. You can read about it. But I want to go to verse, we have, stop at verse 18. I want to just say, they have not known nor understood. For he has shut their eyes, this is it. He has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth, this is it. He don't even think about it. There's a such thing called pause and reflect. That's what the Sabbath is for. You pause and then you reflect. This man should have paused and looked and reflected and said, what in the world am I doing? Listen to this. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, listen, to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? Mm. He doesn't even stop to think. What are you doing? What are you doing bowing down to these idols that you make? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? This is called the dumbing down effect. There's a word that's going around, other than love, that's going around. I hear people say it a lot, and it's called stupid. <laughs> people, like to, people like to say stupid, just like that. And what that says is this. People are coming very opinionated. If someone does something different from the way they would do it, they're stupid. There is a such thing as stupidity. And that was what you just read there, this man did. That was stupid to bow down to an idol like that. To make it and then bow down to it. But that word is going around a lot now. Stupid. And what, you have to be careful with that because what you're saying is 
my opinion is the right what? Opinion. You have already made yourself a what? Watch out now. Be careful. Be so quick to call them. oh, that's stupid. They stupid. Why? Because they didn't do it the way you would do it. When affections are misplaced, when affections are misplaced, people cling to lies as their best treasure. You know what? We should be a little bit more suspicious of ourselves. You know, I, you know, I, it's like Jesus told about the, the mother and the father and, and, and the son and the daughter. Say, look, these people are sinners. The human being is sinners. They got fault. They in need of salvation. They in need of new birth. Be converted. They're liable to do anything. You need to take time to teach them and show them the way. You need to take time to show them what salvation, where they can get it from. He says, you need to tell them that I am the only one that can deliver them. We have to teach them to fear God. That they don't start making gods for themselves. Talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, is there a cue for our doctrine? Is there a cue for our doctrine? Well, remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? That'll cure it. Amen? Keep it holy. If I has made it holy, that will cure what? A doubt. Delight in my Sabbath. Keep your foot off my Sabbath. Doing your own pleasure. Focusing on who? God. They said, listen to this. Now we're sitting here today. We, this man was back then before Christ. This man sitting down cutting up wood and carving it and making an island and bowing down to it. We say today that I would never do that. And I, I don't expect to go to any one of your house and see some statue out in the yard and you bowing down to it, got the fire and go all around it. I don't expect to see that. <laughs> but Jesus said, if you love them more than me, he said, oh, but you don't know what these folk can do. Modern idolaters would not accept the idea of making a, and bowing down to an idol. The claim is we are too advanced in our thinking. We live in the time of enlightenment. We have a better understanding. This is this quote. This quote comes from, I don't usually do this, but this is a quote. It says, from the spirit of prophecy, which is God's light to his people. This is what he said. Modern Israel are in greater danger of forgetting God and being led into idolatry than were ancient Israel. We ought to be a little bit more suspicious about ourselves. What do you think? What do you think? Amen. Amen. So I won't do that. That's crazy. He said, what about a fool who try to make his own God? <laughs> this is this, but we're talking about the law of God now. This is, this is where we get trip, tripped up. Here. We get tripped up here. Two things especially are of great temptation to us concerning the nature of God's law. Oh, I'm a law keeper. Oh, I, 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 uh, oh, I obey the law. I'm especially obeying the law because I go to church on the Sabbath. Okay, all right. There was one time somebody came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, which is the greatest of the law? Which is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus do? He summed it up in two parts. And they said, I thought it was 10. <laughs> Two. He said, you know, you know what he said. Now here's our problem. Here's our problem. The connection between supreme love for God and love for our fellow man. We got a problem with that. I got a problem with loving God. First of all, I can't see it. So I can just say I love it. But your fellow man, you can see. And you say, well, I don't like him. I don't like them. 
Oh, well, should I go on? I'm, I have to get your permission here because I'm telling you, folks, if you or I fail to become what God has called us to be, who is to blame? All right? Who am I? Who determines who you are? Who says who you are? Let's go to uh, Acts 17. See, we're going to get into something here in a minute now. Acts 17. You know, things can just be assumed. We can get involved. I say, I'll get to that later. Acts 17. He said, things, some things have been going on so long that it's normal and it's supposed to be like that. It is accepted as being that way. 17.26. Acts 17.26 it says, And hath made of one blood, how many? All, All nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. We're talking about the human um, the human race. The human what? The human race. Now that's all right if you just leave it right there. God made all of us the same blood. All of us the same blood. That's what God said. This is. Again, if you and I fail to become what God has called us to be, who is the blame? And if you violate one part of the law, you violate how many parts? Oh, I love you, God. I love you, God. So and so, I can't stand you. Oh, but I'm, I'm a worshiper of God now. Listen to this. Truth is unpopular today. Listen to this. A well-established set idea revealed by science and the Bible not to be true. Listen to this. There is no scientific basis for the term race other than a human race. Now the Bible already said all men were made of the same blood, all nations the same blood, so we're all part of the uh, human web. We all. Now here's what scientists say. It says we are too similar to rightly label any of us as a distinct racial group. Should I continue? That's what scientists say. That's what men say. God is already determined to say all oh, men. Talking about the things we make now. How did we get where we are now? How do we get here? Oh, whoa. What time is it? <laughs> How did we get here, folks? How did we get here? If the Bible says that all men were all men made of one blood, all nations made of one blood. Even scientists say that there's no scientific basis for the term race. We're too similar. We're too much apart. There's nothing, that we, we, it's just not enough difference between us to say that one group is distinct and different from another. Amen. That we can start stigmatizing and discriminating against. This is what it said. Race is an example of how we build things socially. Mm -hmm. How we create something that essentially does not even exist. Mm. So you can't talk about that man back then in the Israel time bowing down to that statue. Because we are bowing down to the race God. Mm -hmm. 
I know I understand. I understand. I know it don't sound good. He said, I came to hear something good about God today. Well, you hear that God wants to correct this stupidity. Preach it, preacher. <laughs> Go ahead. How we create something that essentially does not exist, yet it is deeply rooted in our society. For one group to discriminate and stigmatize another group violates the law of God. But it takes on it takes on a real force. It takes on an authority. It demands respect. I was talking to a gentleman just the other day, and we started, as soon as we started talking, he started bowing down to that race God. And you know, God has called us to be witnesses and the teachers and the leaders of people. He has called us, He has enlightened us. You don't play along with that. Amen. You bring people up to a balanced view. I mean, I, I, I could have got there, we could have got there, we could have been talking for, for 30 minutes about injustice towards certain groups of people, the race issue. I said, man, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I, I, man, I watered that thing down quick. And we went in another direction. But that's what God has called you to do. Amen. But that's what people are. That's what people are. They, they, you know, they don't understand that we make gods. In our imagination, we make gods. And then we bow down to them. We bow down. We pay homage to this non-existent idea as if it were a real living thing. And I tell you what, people do live it out in their lives. Well, the race God tells me, I, you're not acceptable. The race God tells me you are inferior. The race God tells me you got to struggle. You got to really, really, really struggle. You got to go way above and beyond what you can do to prove yourself to be as equal as them. Then you made yourself a God. This thing can get all tangled up. Listen to this. Whole nations, societies, and even churches are built around nothing. Oh, y'all don't believe churches have been built on the race of God? You don't believe that, do you? I ain't going no further with that. You know better. <laughs> I remember going to school. At a young age, I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. Something wrong with this picture. They over there. Going to the same place I'm going for the same thing. I'm going this way. They're going that way. They stop right there and get it. I got to go way over there to get it. Come to church. Go to church. <laughs> go by. You see only certain people come out. You go to this one, you see all these certain people go in. And they're supposed to be worshiping the same God. Loving the same Jesus. Revelation 13, 2. I'm gonna leave, that, leave that God alone for a minute. Let's go to another one. And I'm going to start closing here in a minute. But I, I thought, I thought, I thought, here's what I thought. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I believe everybody here is waiting on Jesus to come back. Amen. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. But I ain't going to go that far and say everybody's prepared for that. Because everybody ain't prepared for that because they're still worshiping them, them self-made gods. And God wants to clear all that up. He really wants to save us. He really wants to deliver us from that kind of foolish thinking and the crooked imagination that, that form these gods. 13.2. Now this, this one now, you're gonna, if, you did, if you never heard this, then you're going to have to get into a little prophecy reading 
to understand this, but here's what it says. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now, like I said, if you've never read that, you might have to get into a little, little Bible problem. But when I read this, you're going to understand a little bit more. On March 7th, in the year 321, Roman Emperor, who 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 did this? Constantine. Oh, was y'all already ahead of me? <laughs> Roman Emperor Constantine I issued a civil decree making Sunday a public festival. They called the Day of the Sun. The pagan festival came finally to be honored as a divine institution while the Sabbath instituted by the great God himself was pronounced as old and obsolete. Now, who would dare to attempt the change of the one commandment designed to keep before us the living God as the source of our being and the only object worthy of reverence and worship? Somebody. Who would dare Somebody do that. has made a god of himself. Study on her own. So he changed the Sabbath. It's Praise the Sunday. Lord. He changed the Sabbath. There you go. To worship on the same day as the sun. Mm -hmm. You heard that? Amen. Did you hear that? I read stuff. For her. She's been coming here for the past several weeks. She's uh, she used to, she came out of the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody here studying with her either. But we know who we worship now, right? Yeah. All right, now, now, that day was made, the first, now listen, 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 the first day of the week, Sunday, was, came to become a sacred day. And it ain't God's day. So when, so when when my brothers and sisters in the other churches go and worship on that day, who are they worshiping? Revelation 13, 2 says that the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Oh, man. In the Bible, Satan is revealed as... Now, you're talking about a crooked imagination. Listen to a crooked imagination. In the Bible, Satan is symbolized as saying, I shall be like the Most High. Now, you're talking about a crooked imagination. <laughs> All right. Here's the message. Put away your idols. Isaiah 42.8. Isaiah 42.8. Put them away. Isaiah 42 8. This is why you're going to put them down. You got to put them away, folks. You might as well put them away. I'm telling you, you might as well put them away. It says, I am the Lord. That is my name. That is my name. Mm -hmm. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to grieve an enemy. So put them away. Amen. Put them away. That's the message. Put them away. You know we have the potential to make them. Put them away. I think we're ready. Because yeah, I, I need to. I'm not going any further. But I'm going to wind it up to this. Then listen to this. Before the music starts playing, I want you to hear this. It says, 
The one object in life, the one object in life is to make every day count for Jesus. Amen. As we meditate upon his beauty and his holiness and get a, a sense of his greatness, no other God will stand a chance of placing him in your mind. It becomes clear there are only two classes of people in the world. And there will only be two classes in the time of judgment. They that obey God's law and they who don't obey. To prepare to meet Jesus, receive his free gift of love now. That we might be able to be found faithful. The things we make. Keep life real, folk. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep it real now. Keep it real. What's our, what's our uh, closing hymn? When he coming? was a lady who, who came to an evangelistic meeting we had here at the church. She asked me, if I accept these truths that I'm hearing, do that mean I become a member of the church? Well, no, I said, become, you become a member of the body of Christ, which is the church. It's good. It is a precious thing to become a member of the body of Christ. Within that body of Christ, there's all kind of truths that God wants to reveal to a people who have been living in darkness for all these years in preparation for his coming. That they'll be ready and that they can help others get ready also. Amen. God is good. Oh, He's very long-suffering and patient. He'll see it through to the end, folks. Hang on. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love and your mercy. It is because of your mercy that we're not consumed. You've given us an opportunity to be ready to meet Jesus, that we might receive him, that we may go and live on high. Thank you for your love and your mercy. All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a moment of silent meditation, after which we'll be dismissed.